Hey friends, welcome back to the podcast Studies and Counseling. We're uh, really lucky today. We've got an amazing guest that I'm getting to chat with, uh, Dr. Jamie Marish. Um, hey, hey, Dr. Marish, how are you today? Hey, Brian, I'm doing pretty well this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah, we were just chatting before about how your work has really touched me. So this is a real privilege for me. Um, but yeah, I wanted to start, we've been asking questions to start with about absorption, the, con the, the idea of being absorbed or being engaged and something. So I'm curious, like what's been in kind of engaging your attention and a passion uh, when it comes to the helping professions or just life in general? I'm so curious. It's a great question. And it's something that's ever evolving for me. Uh, wow. Hmm. I'm going to breathe with that for a second. Because yeah, I can give you kind of the canned superficial answer that whatever is I'm writing about at the time is what's most on my mind. So I have just come out of a year of promoting Dissociation Made Simple, which is my book that came out last year, yet it reflects my greater passion and advocacy for normalizing dissociative experiences, which can still be very stigmatized in the mental health professions. And I have a flip chart edition of the book coming out in June of 2024. So that has been something I've been working on as a, a creative expressive arts person. I'm really excited about it because the publisher has worked with some beautiful visual work in that book that has really allowed me to lean into this expressive arts passion I have, that mm -hmm. it's not just one form, it's not just words, but we can work with images, we can work with symbols, we can work with movement. And the flip chart is taking the book even a step further. I've also been rather absorbed. My fall 2024 release is my memoir called You yeah. Lied to Me About God. Oh. which is about my own experiences with spiritual abuse and trauma. Mm. So that's been another area that even though trauma is my jam, as weird as that is to say mm -hmm. that that's my specialty I'm known for, there's so many different areas of trauma I've been trying to create or at least further conversations. And one is, of course, dissociation, as I mentioned. Another has long been identifying that spiritual abuse and religious trauma are legitimate forms of trauma that so many people experience. And it's not just something that people who have gone through what we traditionally consider cults to mm -hmm. have experienced that even religions that we can regard as very mainstream, if they're practiced in abusive, restrictive ways can be harmful, especially to LGBTQ folks. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's something we were talking about in our pre-conversation is expressive arts. Expressive arts has long been a passion of mine as part of this larger work that I do on eliciting conversations around trauma and growth and uh, removing stigma that expressive arts really ought to be in every mental health counselor's toolbox in one way or another. Even if it's not a primary specialty of yours, uh, there's a recognition that so much of what we hold that's unhealed can't be put into words and other forms can give us greater potential for, for working with those things. So in our pre-conversation, I was smiling when you talked about my book process, not perfection, which is yes. almost five years old now. Yeah. Uh, yet I have also just relaunched, rebooted a, a book course with some new videos from me uh, that is along that line. So anytime I can use the expressive arts or speak about the expressive arts in how I teach and how I share these other messages also makes, makes me very happy. Awesome, Dr. Marsh, that's great. Yeah, I'm going to show my well-worn copy of Process Not Perfection. Oh, fantastic. Like it makes me smile. <laughs> yeah, it's been hugely influ influential on my healing journey. And um, yeah, I think what you're giving us with that reflection on, on what's absorbing you really can direct our conversation because there's a, like a really beautiful tapestry there. We've got like we can look at disassociation, um, which you've been really exploring um, in your clinical work, but now in your written research mm -hmm. work and then um look at maybe some spiritual uh, trauma like the the that um that aspect of your work and it sounds like that's very personal if you're exploring that through the form of memoir and and then yeah and then maybe circling back to okay we've identified these kind of really important things that are popping up in our culture right now that we can work with as clinicians what can we do about that and we can look at the expressive arts and how uh, and your work with process and perfection. So maybe starting with this disassociation, like I'm moved to 
like explore this like like how 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 would you how do you understand disassociation as like a as like a symptom or experience that people are having and what's been yeah what have you been learning in your written work on it so in the spirit of dissociation made simple whenever i have a conversation about this i like to get on the same page with everybody about what it means yes because i think the field has a rather esoteric view of it and they make it more complicated than they need to okay so dissociation simply means to sever or to divide it comes from a latin root origin and Pierre Genet, the French hypnotherapist, psychiatrist, was the first one to coin it as a psychological term and identifying it as a real natural, normal response to intense trauma. And so if we think about the root word origin to separate or to divide, the question then becomes, what is it we're separating or dividing from? And the most simple answer to that is the present moment because the present moment is unpleasant. The present moment is painful, is stressful. It could even be boring for a lot of folks. And this is where a lot of kids who are unchallenged in their learning environments leverage a lot of dissociation because they're just bored and not engaged. So it's hard to stay present. So the ways that most every human being, I would even say every human being has this potential to separate or divide would include symptoms like daydreaming or zoning out, what we might call checking out, the 100-yard stare, uh, losing your attention on the highway. These are all real natural, normal forms of dissociation that we see happen in the human experience. And obviously, the more stress or the more impact of trauma that a person is exposed to, this can really become a survival line to do this more often and more intensely. And then that's where it can get confusing to a lot of professionals when we start discussing things like parts or separating from aspects of experience or having amnesia based activity where a part can develop that for that is that carries a memory for somebody and the uh, person who you think you're dealing with in therapy may have periods where they've blocked out or blanked out dissociation can also mean though the severing between let's say mental processes and the emotional and embodied experiences. So when we talk about people being in their head and not in their body or in their feelings, that is also a form of dissociation. So it shows up in, in many different ways, really depending on the nature of trauma and the response that that was leveraged to navigate that trauma. So that's, that's the kind of 101 that I like to start people with uh before deepening the conversation yeah it makes so much sense yeah and it's 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 like one of those things that's a little complicated working with for me it feels complicated working clinically because you've got this natural state we're all disassociating like when driving it's just like mm -hmm. there's a spectrum of you know when uh survivors of trauma are experiencing this level of disassociation that becomes like really mm -hmm. become like really really chronic so i'm curious like I like to work with like empathy a lot um, yeah. in my practice. And so I'm trying to connect with people and, and, and con connect with their experience. And yeah, I'm wondering, so we've got this one-on-one definition of um, disassociation. Like when this shows up like clinically for you, like what does that kind of look like? Where like, okay, this is maybe it's reached, reached a threshold where this is really impacting someone's life and we want to like work with it. Yeah. How do you kind well, of determine that? The, the stereotype that a lot of clinicians tend to go to is when you have things that might start to look like dissociative identities where different mm. parts are at play mm. and these parts seem to be wreaking havoc on individuals' lives. Because yeah, it's very common in dissociative identity systems, for instance, for some parts to have a lot of protective qualities, maybe even some self-destructive qualities. Mm. And so that is... A, a, a more I shouldn't say, it's not obvious it's one of the more stereotype dissociations clinicians have yeah. of dissociation showing up but I go back to something I said a few minutes ago I hear many clinicians talk especially in trauma circles about the disconnect that people tend to experience between the head and the heart yeah. or the head and the body that is also a form of dissociation because there is something unsafe 
about being in the body or being in present moment feeling. And the other kind of one-on-one piece I like to ask people to consider is what is the function of dissociation? And it typically exists to either meet a need or to protect. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, that body mind disconnect is likely a protective response that started, let's say in early childhood trauma or stress when it was not safe to feel feelings because in a lot of high demand or dysfunctional or abusive homes, feeling feelings got you in trouble. Yes. So that is a way it may clinically show up as something like depression Mm -hmm. or anxiety, Mm -hmm. things that might be more of the common cold diagnoses in mental health. Yet a big key point of the dissociation made simple work, because I spoke to 61 contributors for that book, people who have lived experience of dissociation in, in a variety of forms. And a huge finding is that not everybody with dissociative experiences necessarily has a dissociative disorder diagnosis. Yeah, There's this recognition that dissociation can show up in just about any clinical diagnosis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. This, this point you're making about like the function of the dissociation, I think this is such a beautiful um, thing for us to consider, you know, before going into pathologizing, like even when our clients are coming to us with a lot of suffering, almost mm-hmm. like advocating for that part so we can maybe make an alliance with it. It's like, oh, well, this is really protecting you or it's really uh, meeting a need of some sort. I think that's like such a huge perspective. Maybe I could just indulge myself talking about like oh. the experience a little bit. Um, because like, I think one reason I'm really glad we're talking about this is like what you mentioned, sometimes we can miss the, uh, things um, which, uh, when assessing, like maybe we can miss dis- uh, dissociation. Um, I'm thinking my long suffering therapist, when we figured out that um, how prevalent dissociation was for me, because, mm-hmm. you know, like chronic anxiety, it just becomes part of the mm-hmm. system. And it's hard to to, to realize, like it became so liberate and her and her empathy and genius she's like i noticed that we talk about some like really difficult stuff and you're like so articulate about it and that's like that's interesting because i'm feeling like really a lot of emotion and she was holding the emotion in the session for us you know and i was really you know Mm -hmm. apologized it a lot and then realize like this is happening a lot it's not necessarily the classic like did stuff where i can't talk about the experience but i talk about it from a witness perspective and, and don't feel it um, and go through a lot of life like that. Mm-hmm. And that kind of assessment that she did, you know, really accelerated our, our therapy because we started working with dissociation as a symptom. So I guess I'm just kind of reflecting on like what you're saying about the importance of re- uh, recognizing this as like a clinical mm-hmm. phenomenon and being able to connect with it. And so maybe there's some questions about um, asking you now about like assessing, like how do you notice uh, when a client or, or or yourself or anyone is going into disassociation, like what are some what are some of the ways we can work with that? That's a great question. My more my most intuitive answer for that mm-hmm. is if you are the kind of therapist who really takes your embodied practices seriously, if Ooh. you f- feel that you a major strength of your practice is your ability to attune to clients. Yeah. If you notice yourself getting a little floaty or drifty or a little disjointed as you're speaking with a client, that could be an indicator. Yeah. And it could be an indicator to explore it further. So I think the most classic symptoms, quote unquote, (laughs) that we're taught to look for is things like breaking eye contact. Mm -hmm. Although we have to be careful because sometimes that's cultural, that in some Mm -hmm. cultures it's not considered appropriate to make deep eye contact, especially when you're talking. So I wouldn't make an assumption if you're seeing the broken eye contact, but I use statements a lot with my clients. Like, here's what I'm I'm observing. You could correct me if I'm wrong. Yet I notice whenever we start talking about your mother, you tend to look away. Is that something you're aware of too? (laughs) And so using a lot of those statements like that is how I broach further conversation. Uh, I already mentioned something that we colloquially refer to as the hundred yard or the thousand yard stare where somebody's just really looking off. They seem 
like their physical bodies there with you, but they're not really there. And I always say to clinicians, you never want to do things like click your fingers in front of someone's face or wave your hand or clap, be like, Hey, are you here? Or where'd you just go in a really snotty way, but just calling their name, Brian, this is Jamie. I'm wondering if I can check in with you right now. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if, if you're fully here with me right now and that's okay if you're not. Yeah. Yet for our work, is there something that just happened that I, that I can be aware of? So, um, if a person talks a lot about being a daydreamer Mm. or living in their internal world a lot, and as a creative person, I want to be very careful not to pathologize that because I do think a lot of that is the real seed of creativity. Yeah. Uh, Because as a child, I was obviously a chronic daydreamer and had these internal landscapes in my own inner world inside and that's what kept me kept me safe and reasonably sane in yes. the environment I grew up in, right? However, there reached a certain point where I did it so much, it kept me disconnected from the life I was being asked to engage with. But healing never meant getting rid of the daydreaming altogether. It was really letting it come into a balance. So I think the conversations you can have with a person end up being a really good assessment. If you have an understanding of what dissociation is for yourself, uh, there are tools you can use. The most standard one is the dissociative experiences scale. Uh It's available free online. There's online versions of it that people can take. That's the one I like because it's 28 questions compared to some of the other ones out there. It's shorter And it is, I think when it works at its best, functions more as a conversational tool, Mm -hmm. as opposed to here, take these 60 to 200 questions, then I'll score them and we'll, we'll do a number readout to see how pervasive your dissociative symptoms are. Something I could tell you as a dissociative system myself is I really resent being put into number boxes (laughs) because my, my brain feels more creative, more numinous than that. So, uh, I, I like to go at it through conversation. And that's one of the reasons why in my educating on dissociation, I really encourage professionals to start noticing where does it show up for you in your life? And then when you can get a better handle on that, I promise you, you'll become better at having these conversations with your clients. Uh, yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's really inspiring to hear you talk about kind of your process with, like assessment. Yeah, that scale. I'm, I'm kind of moved to, to talk about two things. We'll see which one comes up first. There's the one about, you know, the conversational approach that is mm-hmm. painful for me, but then also the how if we give some space uh, without pathologizing, how, you know, some of these systems, there's the beauty, there's the gold in them, like the creative mm-hmm. process. And, and so there's a thing on that too. And I also link that to meditation because dissociation has actually been really helpful for my meditation practice. And uh, interesting ways and so um or the witnessing that is kind of close uh-huh. to this association i know you're an avid uh mindfulness practitioner too. yeah but first maybe this the scale thing uh-huh. uh, because this brings up so many interesting things in our work about like the pros and cons of assessment and diagnosis like it's such an interesting conversation and i just remember like i think there is an a liberating aspect that can happen to it because yeah the therapist i'm working with used that scale And it's interesting, like how things can be revealed to us that through like a structured assessment, like I didn't realize I have this thing that is so funny that happens to me where uh, I'll get into dissociation when having these absorbing conversations, other people experience it as like great conversations and I'm scared or something. So I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And then randomly someone will be like, Brian, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's great to see you. And I would like have no memory of our conversation and I feel like some guilt and, and I'm like, I don't know who you are. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that on that scale, they have like a whole thing about that. Do you forget people in conversations? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so like that opened up a whole new right. thing for me. Um, and yeah. I think part of the conversational beauty of that is an item like you just mentioned, sometimes that's better explained by we're overwhelmed. Yeah. I don't think any of us are designed to know more than 
a couple dozen people and in this day and age especially if you work in a public forum like you're working here a lot of people are constantly introducing themselves to you yeah so yeah i know for me that's not always dissociative good point yeah. in 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 a you know, i don't even like this word pathological but in a problematic way let's yeah. say that yeah it, it could be dissociative in a in a way that like yeah i'm overwhelmed so it's going to be natural that i'm going to forget some things we don't need to pathologize everything unnecessarily so one of the i'm looking at a sticker i have right now okay because one of the chapters in dissociation made simple is called dissociation is not a dirty word Ooh. and this speaks to a lot of what I've encountered in my work in the field now, these 20 years of every time the word dissociation comes up, a lot of my colleagues get, get, you know, we, we can't let them dissociate or it's a bad thing. It's a, it's a normal thing Yeah, is what I really have tried to emphasize. And yes, some people activate their dissociative superpowers more than others because they're living, let's say in higher degrees of stress or trauma or overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And I think part of good clinical engagement is helping an individual to determine, okay, where is this becoming a problem for me? Yeah. Versus where is it part of my ordinary survival structure here or something that really helps me cope in life on a day-to-day -day basis. So dissociation is not a dirty word. Let's, as we're doing here, have a conversation about it. That's great. Yeah, there's a stigma. There's an advocacy and stigma reduction aspect to your work, too, with that chapter. And by the way, I love your process of printing out the stickers. That's that's so cool. We'll get into that in the creative process. Section. Sure, sure. But I love that. I just wanted to ping that. Um, but yeah, there's like this. I think about it, especially with something like DID, right? Like the when Hollywood gets involved, I oh. I, I think about this a lot with OCD as well. And it's it's yeah. so, so we have to do advocacy for this because um. I think I want to, I'm moved to do more advocacy for these kind of uh, romanticized or things that mm -hmm. get into culture and then it can get confusing. Well, good for you for doing yeah. that advocacy. I've, I've done whole talks and I always speak on podcasts about how the portrayal of dissociation in media is part of the reason we have this stigma problem in the yeah. field, because I'm not going to lie. It can be an entertaining thing, especially mm -hmm. when it's exploited. Mm -hmm. And I am I'm working and I want to promote this resource because I do think there is one good film out there on okay. dissociation. It's called Petals of a Rose. Mm -hmm. And it's available at the director's website. His name is Dylan Crumpler, uh, D-Y-L-A-N-C-R-U-M-P-L-E-R. So if you go to dylancrumpler.com, you can look up this film called Petals of a Rose. And Dylan is a film student, was a film student, he has since graduated, who has a mother with DID. And he was, again, so incensed by the portrayal that he kept seeing in media. And even some of these portrayals that have been known to be better, like I Am Jane and the United States of Terra, there's still problems in there, especially with exploiting the entertainment value, sure. as opposed to really giving a good, honest portrayal. So he co-wrote this beautiful 15 minute short film with his mother, which I highly endorse. And I use it in a lot of my teaching and I really encourage clinicians to check it out and to pass it along to your clients if appropriate, or to have it in your discussions. Um, Cause Dylan has become a friend and we're doing some collaborative work together. And yeah, we often exchange back and forth messages about, can you believe how it was portrayed in this movie, <laughs> even as, as a passing joke? So yes, the, the stigma in film is a big part of the problem. And I say that with a broken heart, because I think film can be a powerful vehicle that has helped destigmatize some other conditions. For example, the 2000 film 28 Days with Sandra Bullock is one of my favorites that I think gives a real human view of what the rehab process can look like and what struggling with addiction can look like. So I think film can be a very powerful vehicle, but there's something about certain conditions like DID, like you're mentioning OCD, which can be exploited for entertainment value. And that's a part of the problem, especially when clinicians are using those as frames of reference yeah. for how they conceptualize a, a certain condition. Yeah, how we conceptualize things, which can be very unconscious, 
you know, especially with, yeah, and, or conscious even, you know, and, and then our clients who, yeah, we might not even look at these things as options. Um, and sometimes mm-hmm. true, I haven't done as much work with the uh, DID, but especially with OCD, you know, that can be such a, and there's a lot of pitfalls to di- uh, diagnosis and a lot of advocacy mm-hmm. that needs done, but getting some clarity and having some strategies and like hearing, you know, how people have conceptualized like OCD can be so like liberating for people. Even, mm-hmm. you know, we have a shared interest in addiction. Um, there can be an OCD quality to addiction sometimes for mm-hmm. a subsection of clients who are very rich ritualized. And so let me try this one out on yeah. you because this is another part. We have a the whole exploration and dissociation made simple about this addiction can also be a further progression of dissociation yeah because and i'll share a little bit of my personal story with it so i'm in long-term recovery i've been sober since 2002 nice. yeah. and when i was starting to really wake up to life let's say 2003 2004 i started my graduate program uh these dissociative symptoms really emerged And as I later learned, they came back because they were there big time when I was a kid. I just was not really conscious or cognizant of them. And then at some point in my teens, the addiction, the addictive substances became the primary way I dissociated. They became the primary way I severed from the present moment that was unpleasant. And uh, one of my colleagues, Adam O'Brien, and I have a model called addiction as dissociation, where we essentially posit that for children, for young people who grow up in trauma, who are used to dissociating as a way to cope, as a way to survive, when addictive substances enter our picture, enter our life, it can help us disconnect from that present moment faster, harder, longer. And so like in my case, after sobriety set in, there was still a lot of these dissociative tendencies there that had to be addressed. And that's when I really got serious about doing trauma-informed care and my Mm -hmm. own dissociative issues were identified by my clinician who was treating me. So yeah, a lot of addiction. uh, And this is a great area of debate and discussion. We could probably have a separate episode about what's really causing it. Yeah. And I, I've really come to see that if trauma and dissociation, if they're not directly causing it, it's at least progressing it. So yeah, yes, there's, there's a lot of manifestations of how addiction can show up. Totally. Yeah. It's so, yeah. Thank you for bringing, speaking on your lift experience with addiction and uh, revealing the addiction as this association model to me. Yeah. I would love to do a deeper dive into that because it's really resonating on an intuitive level. And maybe we could have have you back on and discuss. I'll put you in touch with my buddy, Adam O'Brien, who who developed it with me because he he has a lot more of the nuance to talk about this with what literature says and whatnot. And he'd be a good guest. I'll make sure I make a recommendation. Yeah, I'll jump on with him. And well, it goes back to, I think, something if because we do have a major interest in addiction on the channel. I'm also in recovery. So congrats on your recovery. Congrats on your recovery. Yeah, that's so exciting um, for for us. But uh, this is something that's very it goes back to what you said which i think is a very powerful frame is like what is the function or what is the need of the addiction and you know there's Mm -hmm. such especially with like we're doing a lot of work in pittsburgh right now with heroin you know and it's so scary with the drug supply and you know i work with people who've just recently got a, a hiv diagnosis and it's like such a difficult thing because it's like the 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 new stress the stress is coming up and the coping mechanism is everyone saying this has got to go as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Rid of, and it's so hard. And I think as counselors, you know, like just holding the space with this is a devastating loss. Yeah. You know, of a cope. This is and now this disassociation is coming or this anxiety is coming. And the one thing that has always been there, the family system hasn't been there. The culture hasn't been there. But heroin or alcohol has always mm-hmm. been there. And now it's yeah. not working anymore. And that is such a devastating loss to feel. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy just because of the drug supply, especially mm-hmm. to just come in like, we need to get rid of this. We need to do behavior modification. Mm-hmm. We need to, mm-hmm. it's just a, it's such a natural impulse. And I think it does come up with care. Um, but and I think this is a good way to have this discussion that it's when a skill backfires on you. Yeah. And 
I know a way that I've approached my addiction, the way I've approached my dissociation, my daydreaming is that there was a time it really did work or it seemed to work and it doesn't work anymore at a certain point or it causes its own set of problems. So I, I think we can really get far by people by first acknowledging that. Yeah. And then where do we go from here? Yeah, exactly. And speaking of that, like, where do we go from here? Like, I'm wondering, we've talked about disassociation, this work you're doing on disassociation, and then you have this other thing emerging. And we've talked some about, like, diagnosis and the pros, mm-hmm. pros and cons of it. And, you know, right now, a lot of, especially with trauma, there's this, like, discussion of complex trauma and, like, developmental trauma, and we can't get that as a diagnosis. And then you're kind of bringing in and speaking to this other thing, uh, which is so real from a lived experience, but is a little mm-hmm. not well theorized in my opinion, which is like spiritual trauma, spiritual mm-hmm. abuse, these things that are going on. So maybe we could shift into that a little bit. Like how did this sure. kind of discussion uh, emerge to you? Like what does that, maybe again, if we could do the 101 um, for sure. people who be working with it. Um, well, how it emerged for me is yeah. my experiences with spiritual abuse and religious trauma is what caused yeah. a lot of my early childhood dissociation. Yeah. Because yeah. I had a father who converted to what is, in my view, a pretty extreme evangelical group uh, yeah. that you know is very hateful, especially towards queer people and feminists and anybody who's different than them. And as a very deeply feeling kid who knew probably from around the age of nine that I was different than a lot of other people, that I was attracted to both boys and girls. Mm-hmm it it was a hard environment to grow up in because my dad had some other issues mixed and then the religiosity just really seemed to amplify so many things and my mother stayed very devout in her own catholic faith uh i i would say of of the parents she was the lesser of the two extremes with with how faith expressed but for example my brother grew up to be a catholic priest she stayed that steadfast in her catholic faith so i i have a very religious family as somebody who's who's very different from from them yes so that that caused a lot of the disconnect including some of the extreme measures my father went through you know when when he converted i remember being about 16 and my parents were fighting over religion, which was pretty typical in our house. And as the oldest child who really lived through this conversion of my father's, who who was there, who because my brother was not even born yet when it happened, uh, I I just remember a lot, and I I bore a lot of it, and it always felt like my parents were trying to fight over me, in terms of we want her to pick my religion, we want her to pick my religion, etc. And so when I was about 16, I remember crying in my bed over a fight they were getting in. And I said, spiritual abuse has to be a real thing. Because if it's not, this is what it is. And I'm going to write it up someday. So when I was in graduate school, I was, I actually pursued a pretty Catholic path myself after getting out of the evangelical world. And I was a few years sober. I was going to a um, very Catholic university and I was taking, it's interesting you mentioned developmental trauma because I was taking a developmental counseling class and we had open reign to write a paper on anything we wanted to as it regarded development. So at that point is when I started looking up, is spiritual abuse a real thing? And yes, it had been written up as as a construct. uh, And I did my first paper on it in 2004 on the impact of spiritual trauma on, on development. So The 101 that I I like to break this down with is I prefer the broader term spiritual abuse. There is also a term religious trauma, which religious trauma syndrome, which was coined by a woman named Marlene Winnell. And it's, it's a good book. It comes from a book called Leaving the Fold. And it really posits that religion can be the source of trauma or wounding for a lot of folks. But the reason I I lean into spiritual abuse is I don't think it's just religion that does it because a lot of the spiritual but not religious groups can do it as Mm. well. Uh, I have also experienced it on the yoga side of things because like you mentioned, I'm an avid meditator and yogi and I did study off and on, well, pretty extensively. I never lived at an ashram, but I studied intermittently for five years at an ashram. And even though it wasn't, at the level of let's say wild wild country or that 
kind of cult you'd see in a Netflix documentary, there were still a lot of the same patterns of power and control where God or enlightenment or some spiritual construct is used as the weapon to try to control people. So if I'm asked for my kind of cut to the chase definition of spiritual abuse, it's whenever some spiritual construct is used as a weapon to demean people, to control people, to put them in their place. And of course, what makes abuse abuse is when there's a power differential. And so that can happen at the level of a congregation or a church or a faith community when the leader or the hierarchy is held up. It can happen at the level of the state. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when we talk about at the level of the state, Mm -hmm. examples like the country of Iran have Mm -hmm. often been discussed. But I ask you to consider what's happened in the U.S. in recent years with the Supreme Court going more conservative and a lot of religious doctrine influencing public policy. Yes. And so it happens in the U S very much. And that's one of the reasons I am excited for this book to be coming out during an election year, because even from the time I was a child till now, I've seen especially conservative Christian religion get more inserted into political life. And that to me is a form of, of state sponsored spiritual abuse. And I think perhaps the most pervasive form of it is in the home. When you have a very religious parent or grandparent and to a small vulnerable child, their caretaker becomes a godlike figure for them. And in order to get fed and have a house and have a reasonably peaceful environment, a lot of kids who are not meant to have that particular religion go along with things or have things shoved on them in a way that causes damage long-term. Yeah, and that goes to that power differential uh, that you were mentioning. But the 101 being like when some kind of spiritual principle is weaponized against someone and their voice, their voice or their their being isn't somehow restricted in the name of this spiritual principle. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm kind of moved to ask you Let me see if this, it's not a very pointed question, but let me see if I can get this off. Basically, like, I think it's, you mentioned some like really interesting things. Like, let's just take like the Catholic background and and how you're enriched by like the the ashram and some Mm -hmm. of the work, but then it's also like problematic. Like, so this is like hard to reconcile, I think, like it for me just personally. And I think clinically too, it's like, when the spiritual, how do we re- reconcile? Like, I guess this the the pointed way to ask it is like, what's a healthy uh, spiritual based practice look like? I guess is the pointed question. And then just to yeah. underline that a bit, it's like it's hard for me to reconcile the abuse, the obvious abuse that goes on. And then when I go into like speaking of Catholic, like uh, centering prayer or something that's really enriching. Mm-hmm. So, um, when I do that, so- it's so enriching, you know. Right. And I think that's the key. Like, is it enriching? Is it nourishing? Or is it depleting? For example, even though I survived a lot of this, I'm still a very spiritual person who's actually religious in some ways too. I'm, I'm involved with a very progressive Catholic organization called Abbey of the Arts. I sit on their board. We do a lot of contemplative practices and something that my teacher, uh, Christine Paintner, who's a third order Benedictine Mm -hmm. taught me is to be able to do an inventory. Is this nourishing me or is this depleting me? Oh, cool. And so part of spiritual abuse recovery is to look at what is healthy spirituality? Yeah. What was I raised with or what was put on me that doesn't work? And how can I start renegotiating my relationship with spiritual practice? Because I want to be very clear here that for some people who survive spiritual abuse, religious trauma, the answer becomes, I want nothing to do with this. Yes. And that's fair. You know, I, I, if, if that's what you feel you need, great. And I will say this for a lot of people who have been most wounded by spirituality it's usually because there's something in us that is really built and wired for spiritual connection. And that's what makes it hurt so much. And so what a healthy recovery path can look like is how do we find 
an expression of spirituality that really works for us, that is healthy, that is nourishing as, as opposed to depleting. So part of addressing spiritual abuse and religious trauma can also mean testing out, having a new relationship with all things spiritual. Yeah. Like testing out, like experimenting. Cause yeah, experimenting can be kind of like a dirty word when mm-hmm. it was like a controlled environment, you know, that's like, Oh yeah. Flexibility I think is so important. Cause case in point in on the conservative Catholic end of my upbringing, I got a lot of this, you know, the cafeteria is closed when, when Benedict mm-hmm. became Pope, you, you can't, you know, pick and choose what you want, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, uh, I kind of say bullshit to that now, uh, where I see a buffet as a beautiful thing. Uh, one of my collaborators will often say spiritual trauma recovery. It's like tapas. Like when you go to a tapas restaurant, take small plates, you don't have to commit to the whole meal, but that is how you truly discover what works for you and your spiritual locus of control, as opposed to what other people have put on you. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too. This I'm glad this topic came up for us because um, I think looking in just on a surface level, looking in, I've done a lot of work with like smart recovery. That's been mm-hmm. a good nice. pathway, and yeah, it's interesting. And so I've uh, intersected a lot with like my friends who identify being more atheist, agnostic. Mm-hmm. The, that's not part of their path, their spiritual thing. And I think a lot of the that I've seen doing research, a lot of the sp- spiritual abuse, spiritual trauma groups, you know, there can be a heavily atheist slant to them. Um, mm-hmm. sometimes it'll be just because a lot of those organizations are doing the work. And I think there is something interesting about, you know, coming together as people who are like wanting to explore that pathway mm-hmm. of spirituality. And we're recognizing like these environments are highly controlling and maybe I'm pro choice or like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I have political, like there's ambivalence about various political things. I have secular political beliefs, but spiritual practices, which is kind right. of an interesting place to be in. So uh, what was the question that wanted to emerge from that? Oh, I guess I wanted to ask you, like, uh, what do you, what is spirituality for you? You know, it's something that I have a felt sense of it for myself, but I'm, I'm curious if we could explore that in the realm of conversation. Yeah, for me, it is connection to something that exists outside the scientific laws of nature. Um, it's that something I can't explain, but that I've always known is there. Yeah. Uh, for me, it is a God consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yet I've also learned in my path that God lives within me. God is not somebody who's up on a scary cloud throwing down thunderbolts or granting miracles. That God is something that's very personal in my my own heart. Uh, I use female pronouns today yeah. to refer to, to God because I think God is gender queer, gender fluid, can show up however God needs to show up. Uh, and I know other people whose spirituality is not theistic in any way but it is something like being in nature connecting with this larger sense of the universe uh my beloved sponsor's husband who's also a big part of my recovery network is a very identified atheist Mm -hmm. yet he identifies himself as a spiritual person because he feels so connected to the group and its larger purpose so i think spiritual is just that that thing we can't explain I love that. Yeah. Something beyond the physical, Mm -hmm. um, something beyond the physical. And then you're talking about like how you explore like God consciousness, like a gender queer God and um, your atheist friend is able to, and sponsor is able to connect to like a group consciousness. And I often, I'm a Libra. So I try to like build bridges Mm -hmm. in harmony and love it. Yeah. And I do gently, you know, broach this in conversation with atheist, secular humanist friends, because I really view secular humanism as a beautiful expression of spirituality because it's meaning. It's like it's meaning like choosing to um, ascribe meaning to a universe that you feel doesn't have meaning. Mm -hmm. meaning. I think it's a really beautiful intention. It's like humans have rights because life is precious and Mm -hmm. i feel that you know there's no law that says life is precious necessarily physical law um but i'm choosing to give all humans human rights i think it's like such a 
I find that very moving, um, mm -hmm. actually. And, and for me, yeah. it's very compatible with where I've landed with Christianity. Yeah. In that so much of the toxic brands of Christianity I've obviously rejected. So much of my Catholic upbringing does not theologically make sense to me yet. The reason I still keep one foot in Christianity is this idea that God chose to become human. Ooh, yeah. That's so cool to me. Yeah. And a lot of faith traditions don't have that. And that's why I see God in other people. I connect with, with the divine when I connect with you, when I connect with other folks, because just the human experience is a manifestation of God to me. So yeah. that's where I've landed. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And we're getting to talk right near Advent, um, or, uh, you know, uh, Christmas, uh, mm -hmm. U.S. school for that incarnation idea. I right. really resonate with that as well. Um, okay. So we've got to discuss like spiritual based counseling a little, um, how you look at that and we've explored dissociation. I'm wondering if we can bridge into expressive arts a little bit. And so we've yeah, yeah two, we got a few more minutes. Go for it. Yeah, we've got. Um, well, maybe I didn't ask you. I can cut this out time wise. When are, when are we good to do that? I do have a hard stop in about 10 minutes. Okay, so. 10 minutes. Cool, mm -hmm. cool. Let's do a little bit of expressive arts. And, yeah. And then I'll ask my, my final question. Um, Great. So expressive arts. We've been able to talk about uh, two potential barriers or difficulties people might have um, dissociation. Uh, spiritual trauma um what how have expressive arts been like a resource and a tool for you dealing with any kind of clin clinical phenomenon maybe one of those two um but maybe just a broad question first is like how is expressive arts a resource for you the expressive arts were always there for me uh, as, as much as i've you know talked some smack about my parents on this interview i really okay. want to give them both credit for exposing me to the arts at a very young age. I mean, the two of them met through the arts. They were dancers and musicians in a Croatian folk troupe, which is where you know, our families are from. Mm. And because I had music, because I had singing, I was on stage, I had dance. I would often go into my basement playroom at night and put on a record player and just dance away <laughs> to, to in my own little world. So the, the arts definitely gave me some vehicle for expressing emotion that I couldn't dare articulate in the home growing up so that when I did go to get sober and start a recovery path, I don't think I was as scared of emotion mm. as a lot of other people in my boat are. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I often look at that at how many of my clients and folks who've been through similar things, if not worse than me are, are just very afraid of emotion <laughs> And I, I think the expressive arts, I, I owe that to the expressive arts. And I think I mentioned earlier in the interview that it gives us a chance to express things that I don't think can be put into words or are not meant to be put into words. Yeah. Uh, and by definition, I also want to clarify, we've done a lot of 101. <laughs> this interview has gone a lot of cool intersectional places, right? Yeah. That expressive arts therapy as a discipline yeah means the multimodal use of creative art forms yes because there's dance therapy there's music therapy there's art therapy there's even drama therapy poetry therapy like there's these different principles of therapy that can be practiced and studied but by definition expressive arts therapy as a as a discipline works with the buffet <laughs> using yeah. that metaphor again yes. we work with all of it and so even though a lot of people know me as, as a dancer from my dancing mindfulness work, it's never just been dance to me. It's looking at the fusion and the intersections of, of everything. And the reason I really teach expressive arts is in giving people a buffet in giving people options, you empower them to choose the area that might first be in their comfort zone. However, once you get used to working in your comfort zone a little bit as an expressive form principles of expressive arts teach us that the practice that challenges us the most may have the most to teach us so yeah. i i adore the expressive arts i adore working with it with clients it could be as simple as share your playlist with me what are you listening to right now yes. because you can get a really good 
assessment, quote unquote, there's a very clinical world word into a client's internal world by sh sharing their music with them and going back and forth with that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then your text, the process, not perfection is really good for that because we can be very systematic. It has like, it lays all of them out in very mm -hmm. key processes and it has like, people should check it out, but it just says the, uh, the, my review, it like has each process, key process and trauma healing has one of the expressive arts that you can explore within it. So it's like a really great buffet. Um, if a mm -hmm. person needs grounding and is comfortable dancing, there's a practice there or, or yep. painting. And I just wanted to let you know too, I don't know how intentional, I'm sure it was very intentional, um, but, and, and speaking to you, you said something very evocative and interesting that all therapists, all help people in helping professionals should have this as a competency. And I really mm -hmm. agree with that strongly, um, even though, you, you know, it's typ typically is seen as more of a specialization, something you go really deep into mm -hmm. one form. Um, right. Uh, I, I have found in my, it, it both like to what you're speaking about, helping us articulate trauma and go deeper and explore the unconscious. It's very good mm -hmm. while at the same time can be a resource for grounding and calming. And so like, for example, for whatever reason, paint activates me and crayons mm -hmm. calms me. So I can do very powerful trauma work by just pulling out paint and crayons and then doing some painting. And when I start getting overwhelmed on the same paper, using my crayons, mm -hmm. really help. And so I think expressive arts is like for our trauma therapists out there, people interested in trauma, it has so yes. many applications um, and it has so many positives to it. For sure. And, and I, it's one of the reasons I wrote Process Not Perfection is I hope it could be a compliment to trauma therapists, existing trauma therapy and help them realize, okay, this is something I could reasonably weave in versus, hey, if I really feel that there's a lot to explore here, maybe I do want to pursue some specialty training in it. But something I already mentioned, I think is something any therapist can do, which is what are you listening to right now? Love that. Yeah. Share your, share your music with me. Or I know we often encourage clients to journal or to keep some kind of log in between sessions. What would that look like if you collage some images into your journal or played with the different forms of crayon versus marker versus pencil and notice just the different sensations it brings up in you. And what can that, what good information can that give us about our use of grounding versus maybe opening and expanding? So I think we can all stand to explore it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Marich, uh, for that. Uh, it, yeah. And also thank you. Really grateful for being generous with your time, exploring with us and generous with your story and share, sharing that with us um, and your advocacy and all that. I'm wondering for our final question, um, how can we help you like our audience? Like where can we go? We've talked about some of your resources, but like, what's the thing, some of the actions we can take to help, help, uh, help your, help your goals right now, your work and your research. So, oh, that's, that's so generous. Uh, yeah. my, my, my page, jamiemarriage.com is a simple place people can go to, to see what, what is up with me in terms of where you can train with me. I'm a full skill EMDR therapy trainer. My company Institute for creative mindfulness.com is another website where you can look up EMDR trainings that myself or my network members are offering. Irene Rodriguez, who's a longtime collaborator of mine in expressive arts, she has now taken over my expressive arts curriculum for people who want to actually do formal training in it. But uh, you got it there. The book process, not perfection. I, I deliberately published that through my own company so I can make it available affordably to either therapists who are wanting to explore more on their own or for clients who may not be able to access an expressive arts therapist or even therapy. So the book Process Not Perfection, uh, which you can get on on primarily Amazon, uh, is is a good way to explore that. And I also keep a free resources site, actually two free resources sites that will soon be combining. There's TraumaMadeSimple.com and RedefineTherapy.com, oh. and those sites have everything I've done for free online, like these podcasts. I link the podcast there, a lot of my teaching and resource videos from my YouTube channel, Jamie Marich on YouTube. You can get a lot of uh, demos with me, mostly EMDR, but a lot of general mindfulness, grounding yoga, and expressive arts on that website. 
Awesome, y'all. And we will be linking all of that to something wherever you're watching this, there'll be some easy way to find it. And just one quick shout out to to my folks who we have some a lot of folks watching who are in group, uh group doing group, group counseling. We use process not perfection in my group practicum. And it was so effective and it's so, it's perfect for that. If you want to develop, if you're wanting to do expressive arts in your groups and you're a little nervous, this is an amazing framework. It's very safe. It's very solid. It gives people in the group different things they can latch onto, like Dr. Marish said. And a lot, I, th I feel it, a lot of the obstacles for doing art in group are really well addressed with this text. So if you're a group therapist and you want to explore expressive arts, highly suggested. And um, thank you. We appreciate yeah. that shout out. Very yeah, much. it's so effective in groups, you know, addiction groups or whatever you're working in. Um, OK, so um, I want to say thanks again, Dr. Merch. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone, for watching and staying with us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.